Hello, in this video, we're going to continue talking about stacks. We're going to turn our attention away from using an array to implement the stack to using a linked list to implement the stack instead. Remember that a stack is a logical data structure, so it doesn't really matter how the data is being stored underneath. What makes it a stack is the way that you access it. With a stack, you always add to and remove from the same end, and so you get this effect where the first thing you put, in, you put in becomes the last thing that comes back out of the stack again. That's what makes it a stack. So let's go ahead and start talking about how you can use a linked list to implement a stack. All right, so implementing a stack with a linked list is basically doing the same thing as a singly linked list, except I'm just gonna draw it a little bit differently and change some of the words. So instead of drawing it horizontally, I'm gonna draw it vertically and it will look something like this. And instead of having the head of the linked list, we're going to have it called the top. So let's say this linked list is storing numbers. Let's say it has the numbers 5, 27, and 80 inside of it. Just like a regular singly linked list, the last item's next reference is going to be null. And we could call these next if we wanted to. We can also go ahead and keep with the stack theme and call them something like underneath instead. So now we have an underneath reference that tells you what node is underneath of the current node on the stack. So again, this is exactly the same as a singly linked list, except we've changed head to say top, and we've changed next to say underneath, and I've drawn it in a different way. Now let's talk about how we would go ahead and do pushing and popping with this. Let's say we want to push a new item onto the stack, you can go ahead and write some code for this. Well, if you think about it, this is exactly the same as adding to the beginning of a linked list. And luckily with a stack, the beginning is the only place we want to add. We don't want to ever come down here and add to the end of the stack or insert in the middle of the stack. And so this works out quite well with a singly linked list because we only want to add at the top and that's the only thing we can access anyway. So step one of this is going to be to make a new node. This is basically reviewing a singly linked list, which is good to go through anyway. So we'll make a new node, I'll draw it up here. Step two is to put in the data. So take in the item that you want to add and actually store it within this node box. So let's say we're adding, I don't know, number 11 into this. So now step three, the thing that we need to do is to set the nodes dot underneath, as we're calling it, equal to the top. So that's going to refer this underneath reference to point down to where top is currently pointing. And then we're going to last but not least set top equal to the new node that we created. The order of three and four is super important. Again, we can't get those out of order. So with that done, top will refer, instead of to the five node, it'll refer to the 11 node, like that. So that is all for pushing a new node onto the top of a stack that's implemented with a linked list. And again, this is exactly identical to adding to the beginning of a singly linked list. Now let's talk about pop. Pop will be a little bit different because we didn't specifically look at an algorithm to remove the front of a linked list, we instead had a more general remove method that could remove any of the nodes. So let's go ahead and talk about how to do this. We want to do basically two things. We want to remove the node 11 so that top instead refers directly to the 5. And we also want to return the value that was stored in this node. So again, the order of this is important, just like the pop method with the array. If you remember, we had to sort of do things a little bit out of order from how we might think about them. So the first thing we need to do basically is to store the return value that we're going to be returning as tops data. That's one thing we need to do. So we need to take this 11 basically and put it into a temporary variable because after we bypass top past the 11 node, we're not gonna be able to access it anymore. So that's the first step. Then the next step is to set top equal to top dot underneath or top dot next. And that's going to take this top reference and instead of referring it to the node it's currently referring to, it's going to bypass that and go to the one that's under it like that. And now the fact that this 11 node is still in memory and still refers to the five node doesn't really matter. At some point the garbage collector will come along 
and see that there's no way for us to access this node anymore, and so it'll remove it as part of the garbage collection process. Then the only thing we have to do after this is to return the value that we got. Now, one thing about this code is that if the list is empty when we try to pop, then this is going to give us an error. It's going to give us a null pointer exception because when top is a null pointer, if we try to do top dot something, it's going to give us an error. And so you should just know that that's going to happen. We could, if we wanted to check for that condition and throw like a stack underflow error or something like that. But for now, we'll just kind of ignore that possibility. Anyone using the stack should know that you shouldn't pop from the stack when it's already empty. Okay, so let's turn and look at some code to actually go ahead and implement this. Here we have another class called stack, and this one is in ListStack.java. This stack class creates a stack of double values, and you'll see why we're using doubles later on, because we're going to use this as part of a little calculator program. So the first thing this class does is it creates the inner class called node that stores the two things, the data we're actually storing, and then the link to the next node in the sequence, which this time, again, I've called it underneath, but you can call it next still if you wanted to. And we have a reference to the top node of the stack. The constructor for this sets the top equal to null because when we start off, we don't have any nodes in the stack whatsoever. Then the push method does what we just talked about on the whiteboard. We make a new node first, put the data in, set the underneath to point to what had been the top, and then set the top equal to the new node that we just created. That's the same algorithm for adding to the beginning of a linked list, and it works here. The pop method, likewise, we just talked about, we go ahead and save the value of top's data, because after we remove top, there will be no way to access it. Then we go ahead and have top bypass the current top node, setting it equal to whatever had been underneath the top. And then finally, we return the value that we saved. Just like the array stack, we come up with a little method to also return whether the stack is empty or not. And in this case, it's empty when the top is equal to null. So this is basically just a review on singly linked lists, except that instead of providing methods to add at either end and loop through it and remove any of the nodes, we have a much simpler interface for using this data structure because the stack can basically only do two things. It can push and it can pop. All right, the next thing we need to talk about is a application of a stack. So far, we saw that a stack can be used to reverse things. In the last lesson, when we used an array to implement a stack, we put a bunch of numbers in and then popped them back off, and we saw that they come out in the reverse order of what they went in as. Today, as I said, we're going to do something a little bit more complex than that. We're going to create a calculator program, and the way that we're going to do that is by talking about a format for arithmetic expressions called reverse Polish notation, and then we'll create the calculator program to solve these equations written in this new format. So like I said, reverse Polish notation is a way to write arithmetic expressions. Normally you write arithmetic expressions with what's called infix notation, or just the way that everyone normally does it. So you could say something like three plus two, and we know that that would be equal to five. In reverse Polish notation, this would actually be written as three, two plus, with the operator coming after the things it's operating on instead of in the middle. Now, the reason that this is a thing is because it's easier for machines to evaluate what the expressions are equal to, and that becomes really easier to see if you have a more complicated expression. Like what if we have this? 3 plus 2 times 5. Well, the answer to this isn't what 3 plus 2 uh, it'd be 5 times 5 is 25. It's not 25, right? Because you have to do the order of operations. So you have to do the 2 times 5 first and then add the 3 to that. So the answer is 13. And so if you were to write a computer program to evaluate expressions like this, it's actually kind of complicated and hard to do correctly. But in reverse Polish notation, this would be written as 3, 2, 5 times plus. And that probably makes zero sense to you. So let me go ahead and explain it. The way that reverse Polish notation works is with a stack. And every time you see a number, you basically push it onto the stack. So if we have our stack, we see a number, we see three, we push it onto the stack. 
Then we see two, we push it onto the stack. Then we see five, we push it onto the stack. And then when we see an operator, what we do is we pop two things off the stack. So we pop off the five and the two, then we apply this operator to them. So two times five is 10. We push the answer on the stack. So when you see a number, you push. When you see an operator, you pop off two things, apply the operator, and then put the result back on the stack. So now after doing the times, we have 10 and three on the stack. We see the plus, that's another operator. So we pop off the 10 and the three, apply the operator to them, which is 13, and then push the answer back on the stack. And so at the end of this, we have only one thing on the stack, which is the 13, which is the answer. So the goal of reverse Polish notation is basically two things. One is to have it be easier for computers to give the answers to the expressions because the algorithm for evaluating RPN expressions like this is much, much simpler than the algorithm for evaluating common infix notation expressions like this, much, much simpler. The other benefit of reverse Polish notation is that it's in some ways simpler and less ambiguous for people. And I don't think that too many of you will fall in love with this and uh, start to use it. But there are people who report that when, once you've used it for a while, it becomes really, really second nature and it's easier and sort of less ambiguous to deal with. So let's look at a couple more examples of how you evaluate this. Say we want to add three numbers together, like one plus two plus three, let's say plus four, and add four numbers. In RPN, that'd be one, two, three, four, plus, plus, plus. And so let's go through this. We start by pushing one onto the stack, and then we push two onto the stack, then we push three onto the stack, and then we push four onto the stack. Then we get to this point where we have the plus operation. We pop off the four and the three, add them together to get seven, and then push just the seven onto the stack, like that. Then we get to the next plus, and we do the same thing. We pop off the seven and the two, add them together to get nine, and then push just the nine onto the stack like that. Then we get to the last plus and we do the same thing, pop off the nine, pop off the one, add them together to get 10, and then push the 10. Always in reverse Polish notation, when you are done with it, you should have exactly one thing on the stack, which is your answer. There's a few things that you can do to get errors in this notation. One is if you have an operator that doesn't have enough operands, like if we do like two times, then what's going to happen when we run this is that it's going to go to pop two things off the stack, but there's only going to be one thing there. So that's going to be a problem. Another thing we can do is if we have too many things so that there's more than one thing left on the stack, like if we did like one, eight, 12 times, then we would have multiple things on the stack. We'd have two things on the stack when we're done. And so that wouldn't be a full answer. It's not a correct expression. So let's go ahead and code up a program that uses a stack to evaluate these expressions. Okay, so here we have our stack of doubles that we have created in the last part of this video. Now what we're going to do is make a stack object. So we're gonna call it stack, maybe just lowercase stack equals a new stack. And now we can use this to keep track of all of the double values that we need. The stack here is only going to store numbers. It doesn't store the operators. The operators just tell you to do the push and pop operations. Then we need to go ahead and read in the actual input from the user, which we can do using a scanner. I like to call my scanners in for some reason. So let's go ahead and make a new scanner um, with system.in. Then we need to read in the string expression equals in dot, let's do next line. Then we need to go ahead and I guess break it down into its parts so that we can loop through it. Like if we do this thing where we go through each individual part of it, then we need to loop through the individual pieces. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's make string parts equals to the expression dot split on a space character like that. Let's just go ahead and write a loop to print out all the different parts of it. I'll say for int i equals zero, i less than parts dot length, 
I++. I know Java has the newer like Python style for loops, but I tend to, to use these most of the time. Print out part sub i. Let's go ahead and see what happens now. All right, two, three, four, plus, plus, plus. And it looks like we're getting the pieces out just fine. Let's go ahead and try it with a more complicated one, like 123.4, 65.3, 65 minus, and it looks like we get all the parts of that just fine. So that seems to be okay for now. Now we need to think about what we're going to be doing with each thing. Well, we have to basically distinguish if the thing that we're seeing right now is a number, in which case we're gonna push it on the stack, or an operator, in which case we need to pop two things and do the operator and then push the result back on. And I think the simplest way to do it, which I, I looked up beforehand and I already put the import at the top here, is basically to just try to treat it as a number. And then if Java throws an exception to us, then we'll know that it wasn't a number. So I'm gonna put a little try block in here and I'm gonna say that we're going to convert this into a value by calling double dot parse double and passing in parts sub i. Then what we're going to do is we're gonna push that onto the stack, calling stack.push of this value. But we might get an input mismatch exception which would mean that we tried to convert something like a plus sign into a double and Java is gonna then throw this exception to us. Oops, it's not accept, I'm not doing Python, it's catch. And then what we wanna do is realize that, oh, this thing was not actually a number, in which case we can check if it is equal to a plus sign or a time sign or any of the other things we want. So let's go ahead and for now just print operator. Again, it's best to test your code little by little as you're working on it instead of trying to write the whole dang program. And here I'll print the value that we got. So if it's a number, we should have pushed it and then print the number that we got. But if it's an operator, we're just printing operator. Let's see if this works. Do one, two, three, four, plus, plus, plus five minus and we messed something up. Hmm. You know, I think the problem is that I just typed the wrong exception type. I think it's number format exception. Number format exception like that. Let's try that and see if that made a difference. Oh yeah, one, two, three. I'll just do a simple test for now. Ah, plus, plus. So we got, oh. Uh, I'm printing them out as well. So we got one, two, three, operator, operator. And we're also printing them out down here, which is why it's printing out multiple times. Again, uh, three, three, plus, plus. Okay, so yeah, we're getting the input in correctly now and we're recognizing the operators now. I realize watching me code this live might not be the most exciting video you've ever seen, but I think that it's good to sort of see examples of the process of writing software like this and solving problems and things. So let's go ahead and carry on with it. So I think what we need to do now is check which operators we got. And unlike numbers, which could be any format, and so we should rely on parse double to figure it out for us. I think for the operators, there's only a few options that are going to be recognized. So we can say something like, if the parts sub i, which is, again, a string value, is equal to plus, then we can go ahead and do addition. Let's put another one, and we can say also if part sub i dot equals to a times operator, then we can go ahead and do multiplication. And then at the end of this chain here, I'm gonna say else, if it was something else, it wasn't a number and it also wasn't one of the operators that we recognize, then we can go ahead and print an error message and return out of this. Error unrecognized symbol 
and then we can print the symbol out for them so they can see what they messed up on. And then we're just going to return out of here. And in the main method, if you do return, it basically stops the program. So that's good. Now, what do we do if we have a plus? Well, what we need to do is we need to do two pops. So we can say double A equals stack.pop. And then we can say double B equals stack.pop. Then what we need to do is add them together and put it back on the stack. So we can say stack.push A plus B, just like that should do it. Then we can say, in this part here, the same exact thing, except instead of adding, we're going to be multiplying. And then at the end of this, when we get to the end of this for loop, the thing on the stack should be the answer. So let's go ahead and print that out, stack.pop, one last time. Should do it. Let's go ahead and compile this and see if it works or not. So let's try a simple one. Let's try one, two, plus. And we have some extra output happening, but I think we did get our answer of three. Let me just go ahead and get rid of this print line here so it's easier to see what's happening. And then we'll try it again. Let's try it with the one we did earlier. I think it was three, two, five times plus to give us 13. And that does seem to work. Now we can go ahead, I think, and put in a couple more things. We can put in subtraction and division real quick, just to get this a little bit more complete. We can go ahead and say, else if it's equal to a subtraction sign, and then else if it's equal to a division sign. We're going to go ahead and do those things, except the actual thing is that the order of this is important. Because if you say one, two, minus, it's one minus two. So it's actually the thing we popped off. Second, that has to be the first thing in the expression. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. So if you do like, you know, let's, let's do one. So if you say five, two, minus, the answer should be three. And so you pop off the two first, and that goes into A. And then you pop off the five second, which goes into B. So we actually need to do B minus A. And I think that's the same thing for here as well. We need to put b divided by a onto the stack here. So let's see if that works. Let's say 5, 2, minus gives us 3. 10, 3, divide gives us 3.3 .3 repeating, which is right. And so I think that this basically works. And now, if I had asked you or if I had asked myself together with, uh, with you to write a computer program that evaluates infix normal operations and obeyed the precedence rules that you're used to, it would be actually pretty dang hard to do. It would not be nearly this simple. So that's kind of a cool thing about reverse Polish notation. It's much easier for a computer to figure out than standard expression formats are. This used to be an assignment that I gave in this class but I decided to not use it as an assignment. So I'm giving it to you now, sort of an example, but I think it's a pretty cool thing. Much easier to write a calculator this way than it is to do one the standard way. And you actually get pretty used to reverse Polish notation if you use it for just a little while. So hopefully this example makes sense. And it's another place where a stack is really fits the problem that you're trying to solve. So that's all for stacks. They're an interesting data structure and really a relatively simple data structure. They can be implemented with either an array or a linked list. And the important thing with the stack is that last in, first out sort of behavior. So the last thing you put into the stack is the first thing that's gonna come back out again. We're going to see another data structure next week called the queue, which is very similar in spirit to the stack, except it works the opposite way, where instead of having the last thing you put in be the first thing out, instead the first thing you put in is the first thing out. And with the stack, the important essential detail of it is that you add and remove from the same end of the data structure. With a queue, it's the other way around and you add and remove from opposite ends of the data structure. So that's what we're gonna do next week, look at queues. Thanks for watching, take care.